Welcome to a special bonus episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm your host, Scott Fowler, sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer. We're proud to have the law firm Parker Poe as the sponsor of this episode. Parker Poe Law Firm represents many of the Southeast's largest companies and local governments in business and real estate transactions, regulatory issues, and complex litigation. ParkerPoe.com We had thought our first season had officially concluded in mid-November with former UNC basketball coach Roy Williams, but I've been pursuing an interview with Steph Curry, who's about as big a legend as they get in today's sports world, for some time. And in November 2022, Steph said he would do it. If we could fly to Houston, Texas on an off day during his NBA schedule and meet him there. Of course, we said yes. We probably would have walked to Houston to be able to talk one-on-one to the two-time NBA Most Valuable Player and four-time NBA champion, a modern legend who's still building his legacy. This kid's amazing. Curry again. Finds a cutting curve. Curry again. Oh, Steph Curry from way downtown. He's furious. When we spoke with Davidson's former head basketball coach, Bob McKillop, he knew Steph was destined to be a prodigy, worthy of expanding on his father Dell's basketball legacy. He had every character trait as a basketball player that we recruited. Uh, He never once relented in his character strengths. With the Golden State Warriors, Curry is lighting it up once again this season trying to defend the most recent NBA championship that the Warriors won earlier in 2022. So here we are in Houston with a special episode of Sports Legends that I know you're going to love. He remains a North Carolinian at heart, Steph Curry. Steph, thanks for doing this and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Like a lot of people in Charlotte, uh, I'm a lot older than you and so I was able to watch you grow up a little bit. seeing you even as a, as a child on the, on the Hornets court with your dad. So I wonder, maybe let's start with this. So where you are now versus where you were at, say, age about 17 mm-hmm. when you were junior or senior in high school is hard for a lot of us to believe. Uh, but uh, So I wonder, when you were in high school at Charlotte Christian, like where did you think your own career might peak? I mean... Uh... At that time, I was just happy to get a couple, uh, just the the mass email or mass letter, uh, (laughs) recruiting letters from, my first letter was from Colgate University. I remember getting it in geography class in junior year. Uh, The guidance counselor brought it in the middle of class, and I was like, it's the biggest deal in the world. (laughs) To fast forward to that, uh, you know, senior year where you're really thinking about what college could look like and where, you know, the opportunity was going to be, and and obviously Davidson was – uh, was the best choice and the right choice. But the NBA was a goal, and it was, you know, how much I love basketball, being around the Hornets with my dad and, and watching him play and being around his teammates and just that environment. Like, I wanted to be there, but I had no idea, you know, what my path would be like. It was just kind of an appropriate uh, stepladder to I just want to play college basketball, and then I want to be, you know, a starter, and I want to play well and win a tournament game. and that's kind of how I thought with the NBA kind of in the backdrop of that would be amazing. Um, and because I love basketball so much, I knew uh, I, I love the work behind it mm-hmm. and kind of just, you know, you know, stayed in the present as much as possible and didn't try to put too much pressure on myself. When you were at Charlotte Christian, for those who never saw you play there, what sort of high school player were you? It's funny because it's – I mean, I could shoot. That was kind of obviously the the my strong suit and something that uh, any team that I was on, they wanted me to do. My dad, my college coach, I mean, sorry, my high school coach, Sean Brown at, at Charlotte Christian and any AAU coach I played for, they always told me to shoot more because I was more <laughs> of a, a, a pass first point guard. I uh, love, you know, getting other people involved and – I, I had a lot of confidence shooting the ball, but it never was really something that you know, was like a volume type guy. Yeah, you didn't, didn't average that many points. If I not, not in high yeah. school, no. Yeah. Uh, not until I got to Davidson when I played with another great point guard, and Jason Richards, who kind of unlocked uh, that volume kind of scoring ability for me. Uh, but, yeah, that was, I was a pass-first point guard that uh, just didn't really look the part because I was, like you said, I was – 
the kind of the skinny, scrawny kid on, on every team that I played, and a, a late bloomer in terms of coming into my own physically. So it was uh, it, it made me just it, it built my work ethic because I knew that that was a big part of how I was going to be successful at any level, um, and that I'd have to earn everything. Now for the Knights of Charlotte Christian High School. At guard, number 20, a senior, Stephen Curry. Curry for three. And what were you in high school, like height and weight, roughly, would you say? My freshman year, I was probably 5'9", at best, like 150 pounds, and... I graduated a whopping six one, you know, one seventy. So it was, <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah. I, I tried to wear my dad's shoes back in the day. He wore a size fourteen, knowing I was nowhere near that. But <laughs> one, the selection was was crazy because he, he had a lot of in, in the arsenal. But I always felt like I was bigger than I was. Uh -huh. um, but I was a late bloomer for sure. So I guess that's probably a lot of the recruiting struggles that I had because I just didn't look the part. Yeah, and speaking of the recruiting struggles, so UNC and Duke famously never recruited you, nor did any of the other majors, I don't think, right? Uh, none of the ACC country did. Uh, my list came down to Davidson, Winthrop, and Virginia Commonwealth. And um, there's three really good coaches, you know, Bob McKellar, but Davis, and obviously Jeff Cable, who was at Virginia Commonwealth, and Greg Marshall, who uh, ended up going to Wichita State. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, those are my those are my choices, and thankfully, you know, Davidson gave me an opportunity to play right away, and and uh, really learn, you know, by going through the fire a little bit. Did and did you even get the like the letter you mentioned from Colgate? Did you ever get the mass emails from the bigger one? You know, the UNC no, and my favorite, Dukes of the world. My favorite story of the journey was I played at a in a team camp at UNC Charlotte uh, the summer between my junior and senior year, and. Coach K was there, Roy Williams was there. Pretty much everybody from the ACC was there. And I was like, this is my moment. Like, I'm going to play well in this tournament. I'm going to come home, be patient. They're going to start calling the house, you know, asking about you know, <laughs> trying to get me on a visit or something like that. And uh, I thought I played well. It wasn't, wasn't my best, but still felt like those calls are going to come. And, you know, months passed, got to <laughs> – pretty much to my senior year of high school and still was, uh, you know, huh. just Bob McKillop showing up at our open gyms at Charlotte Christian. Like, <laughs> hey, we still have an offer for you. So um, that was uh, that's kind of part of the journey. It, it actually started with a mentality that we had in our recruiting process. I, we, I've always believed that genetics play a big part in development. So we would try to recruit the sons of ex-players. And as Stefan went to Charlotte Christian from there and became a, a, a very, very good high school player, uh, we immediately gravitated towards him. And if you were to see him back in those days, and there are pictures that uh, certainly portray it this way, he was boyish, baby-faced, and very frail. And it looked at oftentimes as if he was wearing Dell's uniform. <laughs> uh, so we began recruiting him. And then as soon as we could elevate the level of our interest in his junior year, uh, we'd go to his high school games and high school practice. And then that just further ignited our interest. There was one particular game that convinced us. Uh, he was playing very poorly, missing shots, throwing the ball away, dribbling off his foot. Uh, but never once did he complain because a guy didn't catch his pass or uh, smack himself because he missed a shot or not get back on defense because something bad happened in the offensive end. Even in timeouts, he looked Dell dead in the eye every timeout, fully attentive to what Dell was saying. When he was off the court sitting on the bench, he cheered his teammates on. He greeted them as they came off the court. He had every character trait as a basketball player that we recruited, and we were convinced that uh, despite all of the adversity he was facing in that game, uh, he never once relented in his character strengths, and we decided right then we were going to offer him a scholarship. Jim, you know what's interesting, too, about Curry? You hear it, so many outstanding recruits. Here's a young man that uh, Roy Williams, uh, I, I think, said, hey, we just missed on this guy. You know, coming out of high school, not recruited by ACC schools. Shot, and here he is, one of the premier players in the country without question. 
Did that sort of stuff stick with you and motivate you long term? It did because when I got to Davidson, like that's the thing I tell kids now and anybody who asks about the journey is, you know, the comparison is tough because like I always wanted to play, in, you know, in the ACC. I played against a bunch of guys that I felt like I would, could could hang with that were getting those calls and getting mm -hmm. those you know re recruiting offers. But my journey was for me, and I had to embrace, you know, what my opportunity was going to be and make the best choice for me no matter where it was, and Davidson was obviously that. Um, but when I got into Davidson, I was, we were playing against those teams. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of carried, yeah, that, that chip, that motivation. Like, I, even though you didn't want me, it wasn't something I, like, lost sleep over, but it was something that, you know, I really put the work and time in and, and had the confidence that when I got into those – those type of games and, you know, the Davidson versus Dukes and Davidson versus Carolinas and, and whatnot that I'd be able to, to perform well and, and show them who I really was. Well, let's, let's talk about Davidson. Um, let, let me start with this. So I saw a bunch of your games at Davidson uh -huh. dating back freshman year. That was a magical time. But um, not like you won every game, of mm -hmm. course. It was, it was difficult at times. And so my favorite of all those, and I don't know, I wonder if what your favorite Davidson game was that you played, but was the Georgetown game, mm -hmm. 2008. The two in the Midwest is in serious jeopardy after losing a 17-point second half lead. Second round of the NCAA tournament, Davidson's down 17 in the second half, and then you have 25 in the second half. Can I think that Georgetown ought to just camp him down inside. Beautiful pass. Love down, makes it a two-point game. Curry can do more than shoot. He had eyes in the back of his head on that one. And that arena, to me, felt like it was absolutely going to lift off. So I wonder, what do you remember specifically about that game? That is my favorite game, too, just because, you know, we played Gonzaga the game before and got Coach McKillop his first, you know, tournament win, and there was a lot of excitement. And kind of shock around that mm -hmm. experience but then you you realize you you know 48 hours later you're in the, the round of 32 and you're playing the number two seed georgetown with arguably six or seven nba pros that are on the list um and you know kind of the task that's, that's ahead of you and to your point we're down 17 you know we make that crazy comeback my favorite part is just uh I think the year before, Georgetown had beat the, the Tar Heels in the, in the tournament. And so we were playing in Raleigh at, uh, at their arena. And Carolina was playing after us against Arkansas. And so some of their fans came early to watch our game. And it kind of became, you know, the Davidson faithful and the Tar Heel country that was, you know, cheering for us against Georgetown. And it became um, a really electric arena. And, you know, that second half was crazy just – Realizing the what you're, you know, you're, what you're accomplishing in the moment, just the adrenaline rush and the fact that when when the horn sounded and we were jumping up and around, up and down, you know, celebrating that we were going to the Sweet 16. And talk about David and Goliath. I submit to you, Davidson College to the Sweet 16. Unbelievable 17-point comeback behind Stephen Curry. The star of this stage delivers again. You know, coming from the the, the humble Southern Conference, so uh, <laughs> right. it was special. It was amazing. It really was. Um, you told a story. Uh, we I covered your um, Curry for Three, the the event in yeah, August. That Davis, was uh, yeah. yeah, all those all the great things, and and that you you know you got your degree there too. You told a funny story in your speech about, and I wondered if you'd tell it here about the day that you showed up late to one of your very first practices uh, in 2007, I guess it was. Yeah. That was. I'd like to hear more about that. And who would have thought, Coach, that uh, we'd be having this ceremony when back in 2007, late to my first practice? It was a very embarrassing moment just, you know, there's a lot of, there's a standard of excellence and discipline that Coach McKillop preaches. Um, well, obviously being on time for your preseason <laughs> workouts and as a freshman, uh, he put me with some of the upperclassmen. All the coach who's testing me from the beginning, he put me in the workout with all the seniors. It was a 7.30 workout, but my, I didn't have my alarm on the, the right time. Uh, the time has passed. I'm supposed to be at the gym getting warmed up for, the, for our, our session. 
and one of our assistant coaches is calling my roommate trying to you know figure out where I'm at like so I wake up late and I sprint across campus um you know without any shoes on just hauling trying to get over to the to the to the gym and I uh I don't know if I was confident, stubborn, or dumb, but I tried to sneak into the workout about 10 minutes late and act like nothing happened. I get in, I run into the locker room, change into my uniform, practice uniform, and I tried to sneak into to the, uh, to the drill as if nobody would realize that I wasn't there. Um, I think I got there like 12 minutes late, so in, in basketball workout uh, terms that's a long time for mm-hmm. you know you to try to sneak in so I, I i did literally half a rep and coach kicked me out of practice tried to get in the line ran out to get my rep of a closeout before i could even take a breath on the court coach was like get out <laughs> and it was uh it was a, a, a rough welcome to the, to the davidson basketball program <laughs> were you never late again after that was that uh, i'd time? have to check with coach but i'm pretty sure i wasn't late after that <laughs> ever again no. <laughs> When you were at Davidson, did you do anything like the night night celebration? I don't remember if you did. No, uh, yeah, that yeah. was that was new. I mean, I, I always play with, I call it you play with joy. Like I very expressive mm-hmm. and smile and laugh and you know have a lot of different mannerisms and stuff. And I really enjoy what I get to do on a daily basis and you know the highs and lows that comes with, with playing basketball. Like it's 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 fun and I, I want to try to maintain that joy as much as I can. It has evolved uh, a lot in the the, uh, the finals this past year and the night night celebration and all that. It's kind of just embracing the you know the environment that I'm in and having fun. And there's an, obviously an entertainment value of you know what the NBA is, but it all stems from just having fun and enjoying what I get to do and what I'm blessed to do. Hmm, yeah, absolutely. And you always have had that that joy. Um, I wanted to ask about one other thing at Davidson, too. Is it true that you once found a wallet with $160 in it and tr- somehow tracked down the owner? Yeah. How, um, how did that happen? We, uh, I mean, the, the Davidson bubble is real, and we had, you know, just a standard of, you know, taking care of people. And if you're in the Davidson community, like that meant something. And so, uh, me and my roommate, uh, Bryant Barr, we were kind of just walking around campus and I, I found a wallet on the on the, on the the ground. Didn't have any like, identification there, but it had some money in there and all that. But we had a, um, a community board or something just before, you know, <laughs> social media was really killing it that you could kind of post, was, you know, the cat news, you could kind of post um, lost and found stuff and all that. And I had been the beneficiary of it on, on, on oh, okay. uh yeah. The cat Before news. my, it, it, it's, it's called something else, and I keep yeah. blanking on the name. But uh, is you could post lost and found items and stuff. And I actually had somebody return my wallet probably August of my freshman year. Hmm. So I was a beneficiary, of it and obviously it's like that uh, commercial talk about passing on. Um, Pay it forward. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. So uh, <laughs> just doing my part, being a you know part of the Davidson community. How long did it take for the guy to? This is about two days. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, What makes Davidson so special to you? You mentioned in your speech, I think, that it makes you smile every time you pull off exit 30. And just can you put into words for maybe some people who would listen to this who've never been to Davidson? Yeah. What's different about that place than any other? I mean, it's close to Charlotte, obviously, but it's, it's its own kind of oasis. And you pull off the exit, it's doesn't look like much you kind of you know going through the town of davidson and taking in the sights but it's a beautiful campus um you know there's at the time we were there it's probably 1800 students and so it's a very tight-knit small community where you know pretty much every student you know all the faculty and the staff and um you know that southern hospitality is real but it's also there's a standard of you know taking care of each other the high standard of academics um you know, from an athletic standpoint, you know, not really known for things on the national stage, but there's a sense of pride of, of how you approach the balance of being a student athlete on campus and knowing that you have to uh, excel at both is, is, is what the expectation is. And there's no cutting corners on that. Um, but it's just such a welcoming environment. And I have so many friends that I went to school with who still talk about, you know, just, you know, the the good days at Davidson where we all kind of came into our own and really learned a lot about ourselves, 
met some amazing people and created you know relationships that that last you know for a lifetime. So anytime I get to go back, it brings back all those great memories. Do they tease you about graduating thirteen years late? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I got a email for the uh the event nobody knew what year i wanted to, they had to put for the uh, the graduation <laughs> announcement it's like do you put class of 2010 or do you put class of 2022 so i said if y'all let me i'm i'm always class of 2010 <laughs> <laughs> there you go join it retroactively yes a graduate i'm a davidson alum and in the hall of fame it's pretty crazy to say so thank y'all so much To move on from Davidson a little bit, but in basketball, you've made so many shots in your career, and I wonder, as you look back, what is your favorite shot you ever made at any level, or most important, That's a or great question. you know where you can name a couple if you want. <laughs> Individual shot, um, I think my favorite Davidson shot is kind of picking one from high school, college, and the pros. My favorite Davidson shot was the shot against Gonzaga with like 50 seconds left. Um, Andrew Lovedale grabbed an offensive rebound and he kicked it out to me on the right wing and I knocked it down uh, to take a three-point lead and pointed to my my parents in the, oh, yeah. in the student section. That was kind of like the I'm here type moment. And Lovedale keeps it for him. Oh, are you kidding me? And he points over to his parents. So that was that was that's nice. the one that's the most memorable one. Um, high school, I hit a game winner uh, my junior year. It's not very memorable just because it was a Christmas tournament, I think, <laughs> in uh, like Columbia, South Carolina. But it was uh, or no, in Hilton Head. Uh, but it was a your second winner, first though. time, like yeah. XU Coppers or something on that level. Mm -hmm. The NBA is tough. It's not it's not so much a shot. It's more of a game. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think it's game four of the uh, 2022 finals. Curry now has Williams on him, looking to unload it. Flips it up, shot is good. Steph Curry dancing, prancing, and puts it in. And the Warriors up by three. I hit a three with probably a minute and some change left on the right wing, very similar to like mm. the Davidson shot, mm -hmm. uh, where it was a momentum just uh, – it was kind of – it wasn't a game winner, but it kind of sealed you know our fate in that game um, from the – very similar spot. I'm just kind of putting that together, which is really nice. Huh. And where, I can't remember now. Where was that game played? It was in was Boston. That, it was in Boston. Yeah, oh, game, that was the one, the one that you won there. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to Curry. Step back. Three-pointer. Bang! Steph Curry drills the three. That's a six-point Warriors lead. Timeout, Boston. You have always been, I've seen you in a lot of crowds, extremely accommodating I don't honestly don't know how you do it um, and the you know the foundation that you and your wife have is amazing but I wonder if it if it's ever tiring to to be Steph Curry I asked Roy Williams that the other day we were doing a similar interview mm -hmm. would does it wear on you to be Roy Williams and, and have people always approaching you uh, three times in my entire life and all three times was my family somebody tried to get in the way of my family he named a couple of times where it was. Um, is it ever difficult to be you? It is. A, I mean, I, I answer that question saying it is, but it's mostly when, like now, uh, with kind of how life is set up now, being my 14th year in the league, understanding all the different responsibilities and hats that I wear in my life. Times that it gets difficult is just when you're with your family and you're trying to give your kids um, an experience that they'll remember and, you know, a healthy childhood yeah, in terms sure. of giving them perspective Normal. and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're out in public and things like that, it becomes tough to, you know, protect your privacy and, and your time while also understanding that people recognize you and, um, you know, those interactions can kind of go a lot of different ways. So those are the times where it's difficult and you have to kind of accept a little bit of what that is, but also, you know, it's a learning lesson of how to protect Do you your ever family. turn people down? I oh, mean, for sure. Yeah. Um, I can hardly imagine <laughs> doing that. But, yeah. Like, I mean, I was at my, my daughter's volleyball practice this morning, and you're watching her, and you're kind of in the moment, and you got people, you know, every 30 seconds coming up trying to get a picture. And mm -hmm. part of that is, like, respectfully, like, I'm not right now, I'm watching my daughter. And they understand. It's just sometimes, you know, 
it's a lesson that doesn't seem very apparent uh, right. off the jump. Well, that's why they don't come up. <laughs> right. But a lot of that is uh, it helped being around my dad and my mom growing up. One of the classiest athletes you will meet in or out of the association. And when his playing days are over, they should find a place for people like Del Curry. Oh, I'm sure you will. See. We go out to dinner and, you know, fans sure. would come up and all that. And I got to see how they you you know, handled it and first um, time. Yeah. kind of gave me you know, the book on – it's going to happen and you kind of understand it's kind of a part of the it's the nature of the beast but it's also like i can you know uh cater to my family and make sure that you know we prioritize our time because that's important as a father of three now uh, what do you worry most about uh for your for your children i mean outside of just you know being uh in the world that we live in now and and as as for as parents like you want to give your kids the confidence that who they are is enough um i feel like an old head when i say it's like <laughs> we i didn't grow up with social media i didn't grow up right. with you know twitter and instagram and you know just the countless uh, distractions that can come at you from all different angles um i got to have I had to find out who I was before I started to get into the comparison game. And I think that's harder and harder for the younger generations now to, um, to not get sucked into that world too soon. And even that's for anybody, let alone, you know, you know, my kids with, you know, the spotlight of what the NBA and, and our sure. successes has. So I just want them to on a, mostly be proud of who they are, like know that they are unique and they don't have to live up to anything that, uh, the world tells them they have to is who they are is enough and that their parents are there and we're there to support them and whatever that is um, and give them unconditional love on that front um, and that they understand what's really real in, in this life and relationships and how you treat people and uh, how you carry yourself and, and for for each one of them that's going to be different and I can't wait to you know be on their that ages with remind me of now or? Uh, now they're 10, 7, and 4 so. 10, 7, and 4 wow yeah, it's growing up. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that's that's hard to imagine. <laughs> Steph Curry with a ten year old. Oh, <laughs> I know. Um, you mentioned your parents a couple of times. Uh, obviously, they've been very embedded in our, our community for a long time. How have you navigated something that has happens to so many people when your the parents get split up and get divorced? How, how have you managed that? It's it's difficult for anybody, but it's also. Um, understanding who they are individually as people and, and you know, the opportunity that has come with that and getting to know them and, and what makes them happy now. And uh, they're very supportive. Uh, they've always been the anchors of our family in terms of, you know, doing exactly what I just said I want for my kids that they did for me and my, my brother and my sister. So, um, you know, life is crazy and it throws a lot at you and, um, you find ways to navigate it, but the foundation of, of how they raised us and the uh, the lessons that they taught us um, have shaped us to who we are and extremely grateful for that. Um, and I like it really at the end of the day, it's about understanding for my kids and, and our family. I want them to you know be able to have um, that relationship with them because that's going to be important as, as as my kids get older that you want to have so that's sure. that's the priority yeah. and and i think we're uh moving in that direction which is great i wanted to ask you about your favorite nfl team i assume they're still your favorite <laughs> oh NFL. absolutely they've, absolutely. they've fallen on some hard times <laughs> um uh, so your thoughts on the panthers and they've this they're in the midst of another what will probably be their fifth losing season in a row. Do you still follow them closely? Or? For sure. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I had a lot of uh, Bay Area folks and media asking me about uh, this is probably right around when Matt Rule got fired if uh, Christian McCaffrey was going to be on the block. And I'm like, why are you asking me? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the, what the details are on his trade status, but it was funny that it ended up being right, uh, yeah. traded to the 49ers and out in the Bay Area. He actually came to a game recently with uh, his new teammates. Oh, nice. And so, so you uh, saw him? Got to yeah. see him and hang out with him for a little bit. But, um, yeah, the Panthers are still still the passion, still my favorite team, still the team that you know is going to figure it out. Um, 
you know, like you said, it's been it's been some some tough years, and the rebuild is always difficult. And trying to figure out, you know, for for Mr. Tepper and and how he wants to run the team and making the right decisions, coach, quarterback, yeah, all they the gotta way figure that quarterback <laughs> out, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that you know. Let's hopefully say the future is bright, and uh, you know, I'm gonna keep pounding all the way through it. The uh, yeah, I remember we talked one time about five years ago, and and at the time Kaepernick had just began his, uh-huh. and but I mean, that was could have been a possibility for them. Yeah, and I know you were, you know, you you thought he always should have gotten back in the league and never really did. Uh, I mean, the ship may have sailed now, but do you think they should have given a shot to Kaepernick? And any, one of those, any every team should have. Yeah, um, but it's, it's a hard part to kind of digest of you know the why nots and the reasons why so um, sure yeah yeah very uh big missed opportunity there for sure well kind of out of left field question but would you seriously consider playing on the pga senior tour when you're done (laughs) (laughs) uh i've talked to some avid golfers some professional golfers first every time i people ask me about playing professional golf i have to make sure i acknowledge one how difficult (laughs) <laughs> I know it is to play on any of the professional tours and get paid to play golf. It's one of my favorite lines when people know how good I am on the course, but when they yeah. play, like, I don't get paid to play. So yeah. uh, I always make sure I keep that right perspective. But <laughs> I, I do feel like the work that you put into, like, being a basketball player and, and all that, like, had I chosen golf or been out, I, that would have been the, the path for me. I would have been able to figure it out. Um, and applied all the, the discipline and work ethic to to the game of golf. Who knows how the outcome would be? Playing on the senior tour would be an amazing um, goal. I don't know exactly what it would take in terms of your time, in terms of sacrifice, your family, and all that. Um, and you watch how good those guys are at, at fifty plus, and it's like that's not an easy thing. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I ever like close the door on, on the interest or curiosity of what it would, what it would look like or what it would even mean to try to qualify for it. But, uh, I'm going to be playing golf for a very long time, no matter <laughs> one way or the no other, no matter right? what it is. <laughs> and, uh, so much. I love it. 13. Steph Curry's found the fairway. to turn around your fortunes. You said in Charlotte, um, the same time you were in there for Davidson, they gave you the key to the city, and I think you said, maybe sort of jokingly, that if there was if there was a team you didn't you would ever play for that wasn't the Warriors, that would be the Hornets. Yeah. Now, I know that would be down the line, but <laughs> have you ever dreamed about maybe coming back and you know, when you're 38, 39 years old and playing think, a few more years? I think both things can be true. Like, I love – the journey with the Warriors and there's never really been any uh, real uh, real interest in, in playing for any other team but the curiosity around like what it would be like to play for your hometown what it would be like to uh, live in Charlotte be back there um, possibly like whatever set of roots and all that like you think about it for sure but I think at this point you, when you talk about I know how fast things can change in the league and you know, you you try to stay in the moment because it, it is such a fickle league, and there's there's a lot of you know, moving parts. If I could play for the you know for the Warriors my entire career and, and and be one of those guys that had a lot of success individually, collectively as a team, and you know was a one one team guy like that, that list is pretty short, and that it would is. be yeah. that would be special for sure. Um, but like I said, that can be true, and also the curiosity of like, what would it be like to wear number thirty in Charlotte, like my pops? Yeah. And speaking of him, he played sixteen years, and I I, I think one time, several years ago, you told me, well, I wanted to get, to, I want that to get to goal. at least the sixteen. That was right? that is the goal. Yeah. Well, you're gonna pass. You're so you'll surpass that, though, right? <laughs> now, it's what's the new goal? Thing. Well, the I mean, I'm under contract for the next four years, which would take me to year seventeen. Uh, but it's crazy how quickly that that reality came uh, or has come yeah. in terms of, you know, 16 years when I was a rookie felt like an eternity. And then you go through uh, all these different seasons and experiences and you look up and you're in the middle of 14, year 14. I feel like I'm in, still in my prom and still have a lot more basketball to play, obviously, and hopefully, you know, be blessed to be healthy and be able to play 
Um, that year 16 will be special that I get to kind of, you know, give my pops a big hug and, and <laughs> tell him, you know, uh, that was the goal and I made it. Do you uh, feel like the Warriors, are y'all going to figure it out this year on the road? And um, I know that's been an issue so far. It has. Uh, but definitely, you know, understand who we are, our championship DNA, which we've been saying a lot. And we obviously proved last year, but that we have what it takes to figure it out. And, you know, winning is hard in this league and that you get reminded of that um, a lot in terms of, you know, what you what success you had yesterday or last season doesn't really – you know, I mean, you could just show up and everything's going to be smooth, you know, this year. There's different challenges that you have to attack and address and fix, and and we understand that. And uh, I think we're all game for what that what that challenge is going to going to require. Um, it is weird, though, yeah. being over on the road. Like, you think about all the things that we've done uh, in terms of winning at the highest level and being consistent on that. This is a very awkward kind of uh, – situation to be in for sure yeah so unusual because you're mostly healthy i mean you're 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 mm -hmm. your best guys at yeah. least i guess and uh and you're playing lights out i mean i, I guess you, if you do feel like you're playing right now about as well as you for can sure play, it no, seems the, so efficient i think the uh the balance of confidence the skill set the strength the endurance and efficiency um i, I probably haven't played better in, in, in my career but really yeah like I said, a lot of that, we've been really great as a team of adapting to whatever the challenges were for that year to, to win. And this year, it's just a little bit slower of a of, of a journey in terms of getting to that point where we, you know, build momentum, build an identity. Um, but we've shown signs that we can be a really good team and we just have to be able to put it together consistently. And nobody's uh, pressing the panic button yet on what that, what that actually looks like. Last thing, uh, Steph, I just... You have done life very well for a long time. And so I wonder when you speak to kids or adults or whomever, you, you speak a lot in public now too, sort of your advice for life and how to do it well. I think you got to run your own race first and foremost. That's kind of what I talked about in, in terms of my journey. Like I, human nature forces you to almost compare yourself to you know, your counterparts to your left and your right and put extra pressure on yourself to uh, hit these different check boxes or you know we all should set goals for ourselves but um, you have to you know be honest with you know what your journey is for you and embrace what that is uh, all the while being your authentic self like um, I think that's the hardest thing especially for this younger generation to really be confident in, in who they are, who God created them to be, and the uh, the fact that you know there's always going to be this this temptation to look at the, the finished, polished product of what you want to be, and and not em embrace and enjoy the journey of, of what it takes for you to get there. Um, that's that's your race, and you have to run it. And and uh, I think that'll be something, or for anybody's you know experience, that'll be something that's very rewarding. Those are wise words from Steph Curry. Thank you, Steph, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you again for subscribing and supporting local journalism. I'm Scott Fowler, and this is Sports Legends of the Carolinas. This show is produced by Jeff Siner and Kata Stevens, and the director of audio at McClatchy is Davin Coburn. For lots more content and to continue supporting this kind of work, please visit charlotteobserver.com slash sportslegends and consider a digital subscription. Connect with me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fowler or by email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please share with a friend.